Thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. If you have not, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight, where we have some amazing merch and plenty of other things for you guys. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Today has something a little special for you. So we're trying to make these bite-sized little drivable episodes, as we're calling them. And in some games that are more of a cult following, bargain bin-esque, and uh, just overall some games you might not have thought about for a while. Absolutely. This is such a fun game that I think about often, way more often than anybody should. I haven't even really played this game a ton, I guess, but I I find myself coming back to it every once in a while. It's that game I pull out of the closet, out of uh, my own bargain bin, Mm. if you will. It definitely existed, I think, in that bargain bin capacity at one point, but because of that cult following, because of some of the lack of availability of GameCube games especially... Mm -hmm. Hard to to find, I think, even when it came out. Hard to sort of take a risk on. You didn't 100% know what this game was, but it ended up being a lot of fun with a cool, like, cel-shaded art. Love Beautiful Joe is what we're talking about today. Love Beautiful Joe. Put comedy into a video game, um, which we desperately need more of, I think, today. And just created this cult classic. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we just jump right into it and start talking about the Joe that is beautiful. <laughs> so, so, Beautiful Joe is a side-scrolling beat-em-up video game developed by Team Beautiful for the GameCube. It was originally released in 2003 as part of the Capcom 5 under director Hideki Kaimiya and producer Atsushi Inaba. The game was later ported to the PlayStation 2 by the same design team under the name Clover Studio, subtitled in Japan... Arataranu Kibo. The game's story concerns Joe, an avid moviegoer whose girlfriend, Sylvia, is kidnapped during a film starring Joe's favorite superhero, Captain Blue. Joe is shortly thereafter thrust into movie land, where Sylvia is taken by the villainous group known as Jadao. After accepting a special V-watch from Captain Blue, Joe transforms into the Takusatu-style persona, Beautiful Joe, and sets out to rescue her. The gameplay of Beautiful Joe features traditional 2D platform side-scrolling intermixed with 3D cel-shaded graphics. Abilities known as VFX powers grant the player special actions for combat and puzzle solving, such as slowing down or speeding up time. Beautiful Joe was critically acclaimed for its unique visual style and gameplay, earning itself a number of awards from various media publications. A minor commercial success, the game spawned a few sequels with releases seen on other consoles such as the PlayStation Portable, the PSP, and the Nintendo DS. An anime adaptation of the game and a manga series were also produced. Clover Studio Company Limited was a Japanese video game development studio founded by Capcom. The studio developed the PlayStation 2 port of Beautiful Joe, both versions of Beautiful Joe 2 for the GameCube and PlayStation 2, and the PS2 titles Okami and God Hand. The name Clover is an abbreviation of Creativity Lover, as well as the Japanese symbols Mi, for three, and Ba, which is leaf, coming from the names of Shinji Mikami and Clover's Atsushi Inaba. The studio consisted largely of existing Capcom R&D talent, who had formed the company, then called Studio 9, to give themselves greater executive control and thus creative freedom, like Sega's semi-autonomous studios in the early 2000s. The studio focused largely on creating new intellectual property rather than sequels. When these failed to perform on par with Capcom's more popular series, Capcom attempted to merge the studio back into their internal R&D. 
Those at the studio chose instead to leave the company, and Clover was dissolved. Some of the key members of Clover founded Seeds Incorporated, a new development group that merged with ODD Incorporated in October 2007 to form Platinum Games, which has since built up a staff composed of former Clover staff. Other members, including the art director of Okami, went to join UTV Ignition Games at their Tokyo Development Studio, which developed the game El Shaddai Ascension of the Metatron. On October 28th of 2010, one of the most prominent members of Clover Studio and then Platinum Games, Shinji Mikami, joined ZeniMax Media in a deal where ZeniMax acquired his new development studio, Tango Gameworks. Yeah, and so this studio had obviously been used for the development of the port and the future games. And this is basically where Team Beautiful branched into. Because we know that Beautiful Joe was developed by the design staff Team Beautiful, a part of Capcom Production Studio 4. The game was announced in late 2002 as part of the Capcom 5, a lineup of five then-upcoming GameCube games to introduce new content to the console. It was directed by Capcom alumnus Hideki Kamiya, whose previous credits include the planning of Resident Evil and Resident Evil 2 and the direction of Devil May Cry. It was produced by Atsushi Naba, who previously worked on the Ace Attorney series and Steel Battalion. In its earliest stages of development, Beautiful Joe went under the working title Red Hot Man, but the name was changed due to copyright conflicts with the American rock band Red Hot Chili Peppers. Beautiful Joe's development team initially consisted of six people working under a 12-month deadline. As work continued, the size of the team grew, and development ended up taking a full 21 months to complete. The game was conceived as a staff-focused project aimed at increasing the skill of its creators specifically director Kamiya. Inaba stated, quote, We wanted to create a challenging game with stunning visuals and fluid gameplay. As a lifelong fan of superheroes, Inaba's aim was to combine traditional Japanese takusatsu with American comic books. The character designs created by Kumiko Suekane were inspired specifically by 1960s and 1970s Japanese costume tokusatsu television shows such as Kamen Rider and Ultraman. Graphically, the game adapted a 2D side-scrolling style mixed with 3D cel-shaded animation. Despite many games in the then-modern industry shying away from 2D graphical formats, Inaba said, quote, We have been able to breathe new life into the genre because we are using a new stylistic way that hasn't been seen before. The team chose the GameCube as its platform because of their target audience and because it lent itself well to Beautiful Joe's gameplay. The musical score for Beautiful Joe was co-composed by Masakazu Sugimori and Masami Ueda. It was released alongside the score for Beautiful Joe 2 on a double album titled Beautiful Joe plus Beautiful Joe 2 original soundtrack in Japan on December 22, 2004 by Soul Pewter. A music video is played within the game featuring a rap vocal song titled Beautiful World, composed by D.A.I. The video features a group of people, including Inaba himself, motion captured as some of the game's characters. On June 11, 2003, Avex released the video on DVD and released the song as a single. Both the North American and Japanese releases of Beautiful Joe feature English voice acting in order to keep a, quote, Western comic book feel to the game. Voiceover work in Beautiful Joe was provided by Sound Deluxe Design Music Group. Voice actors for the game include D. Bradley Baker, cousin, mm-hmm. Christina Puccelli, Greg Berger, Mikey Kelly, Roger Rose, and Kevin Michael Richardson. Director Hideki Kamiya provides the voice for Six Machine. A budget re-release of the game for the GameCube titled Beautiful Joe Revival was released in Japan in late 2003, adding a sweet mode to decrease the difficulty setting from the original game's kids mode. A PlayStation 2 port of Beautiful Joe was released by Clover Studio in 2004. It was released in Japan with the subtitle A New Hope. The release added the character Dante of Devil May Cry as an unlockable character. The PlayStation 2 version does not feature progressive scans seen in the GameCube version, and the game was also re-released under Nintendo's GameCube Player's Choice label in 2004 in North America and Europe. 
It is said that director Kamiya based Joe's run animation on how he got to work, and the bosses of the game are based on Capcom executives. A little interesting. A little, mm. little, uh, little tidbit. Real life tidbit thrown in there. And in a 2017 interview with Dengeki PlayStation, Kamiya expressed interest in remaking the game. And that would be just lovely. Yeah, so beautiful. hopefully we see something. It would be very beautiful. Something for the Switch. A little, little new Switch action. Now, we've been talking about it a bit, but Beautiful Joe's core gameplay is similar to a traditional side-scrolling beat-em-up. Taking control of Joe, the player is mostly limited to moving left, right, up, and down on a fixed 2D path. The game contains platforming elements, such as the ability to jump and double jump. Combat consists of fighting multiple enemies on screen at once, with the enemies appearing from all directions, including the foreground and background. Joe has the ability to punch, kick, and dodge, which he can do by leaping upward or ducking. Dodging enemies' attacks successfully temporarily dazes them, leaving them wide open for attack. The player has a certain number of hit points in the form of life marks, located above the VFX gauge, which decrease whenever Joe takes damage. Health can be restored by picking up hamburgers. Beautiful Joe features unique gameplay elements in the form of Joe's beautiful effects, the VFX, power, which is designed to emulate camera tricks seen in films. VFX power is used in both battling enemies and solving various puzzles. These three powers are limited by the VFX gauge located at the top of the screen. Normally, the meter is full, giving the player access to Joe's superpowers via his Beautiful Joe transformation. The meter slowly empties when an ability is in use. Once it depletes, Beautiful Joe changes to Normal Joe, lowering his attack and defense and leaving him temporarily devoid of VFX power. The VFX gauge automatically refills over time and can be manually filled by picking up bottles of VFX juice. The first VFX power is Slow, which slows time, causing the player's attacks to be more powerful, increasing Joe's reflexes and allowing him to dodge attacks more easily. The second power, Mock Speed, allows Joe to move at a faster speed, creating multiple after-images of him when he unleashes a flurry of attacks on all enemies on the screen. It can additionally cause his attacks to envelop Joe in a temporary heat shield, rendering him immune to flame attacks and setting enemies on fire when struck. The last VFX power, Zoom In, causes a camera close-up of Joe, powering up his normal attacks, granting him a set of new attacks, and paralyzing all lesser foes in proximity to him. However, any damage dealt to Joe whilst zoomed in is increased as well. Any two VFX powers can be combined, and the VFX gauge can be extended by collecting a certain number of V films present in each stage. The bar reverts to its normal length when a new stage begins. Defeating enemies gives the player V points in the form of small and large coins, while using special attacks gives them V marks, or beautifuls, which can be converted into V points. Beautifuls can be quickly gained by using combos or long chains of attacks. For example, while using slow, striking a dazed enemy sets up all other enemies on the screen for a chain reaction, causing all points accrued during the duration of slow to be multiplied by the number of enemies struck. If used deftly, the player will accumulate a large number of beautifuls due to the multiplier effect called X bonus. Each stage in Beautiful Joe consists of several interconnected missions or scenes that the player must complete in order to advance. When completing the stage, the player is graded on the number of V-points earned, the amount of time taken, and how much damage Joe took. V-points can be used between stages to purchase new abilities, expendable weapons, which include the boomerang and shocking pink bombs, more health, and health restorative items. Clearing the game on various difficulties allows players to play as different characters, such as Sylvia, Captain Blue, and Alistor, with the PlayStation 2 version also allowing players to play as Devil May Cry's Dante. So a lot of fun gameplay, pretty standard, I think, for side-scrolling gameplay, with a few little twists and turns thrown in there. Now, of course, for a game about an avid movie fan, we have to talk about the story. 
Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Beautiful Joe is divided into seven stages or episodes, interspersed with storyline cutscenes, and book-ended by an opening and ending cinematic. The setting is divided between Earth and Movie Land, the game's fictional world of films. The plot begins in a movie theater on Earth, in which the game's central character Joe and his girlfriend Sylvia are watching a tokusatsu drama, starring the aged superhero Captain Blue. The movie's antagonist, having seemingly defeated Captain Blue, suddenly reaches out of the screen and abducts Sylvia, taking her into movie land. Joe is likewise picked up and taken into movie land by Captain Blue's giant mecha, Six Majin. Inside the movie, Joe must rescue Sylvia from the evil Jado, the game's organization of villains. To help him, Captain Blue entrusts him with a V-Watch, a device Joe can use to transform into a superhero upon saying the word henshin, or transform. Joe promptly does so, inventing his own catchphrase, henshin a go-go, baby. With the guidance of Captain Blue, Joe fights his way through a number of movie lands locations such as cities, caves, an underwater base, and a submarine, often traveling via his trusty robot aircraft, Six Machine. One by one, Joe defeats the members of the Jado, the game's bosses. These include Dark Fiend Charles III, Iron Ogre Hulk Davidson, Aquatic Terror Grand Bruce, a doppelganger of Beautiful Joe, and Blade Master Alistor. Before fighting Alistor, he reveals that in order for the Jado to break out of movie land and into the land of humans, they need the DNA of the creator, namely Sylvia. Joe makes his way to find her, trumping the Jado's leader, Infernal Lord Fire Leo, in combat, only to witness Sylvia being kidnapped once again afterwards. Joe and Six Machine race off into outer space after her in the game's final episode. Finding Sylvia atop the control room of the space station, Joe discovers that Captain Blue has been behind the plot the entire time. The former hero reveals that he is the creator of the film in which they currently exist, and that he is Sylvia's seemingly deceased father. Transforming into the colossal robot King Blue, the villain proclaims that he will take Sylvia's energy by force in order to break into the real world. Joe tells him off, telling him that he's no hero. Joe summons six Majin, and the two engage in combat. When the fight ends, Captain Blue and Beautiful Joe abandon their respective vehicles and face off in a final battle within the space station. Joe is victorious, and Captain Blue finally coming to his senses thanks the young hero for stopping him. He explains that two decades earlier, Blue was a revolutionary filmmaker who was soon thought of as a fad. Wanting nothing more than to create heroes, Blue was sucked into one of his own films, allowing him to live out his dream as a hero. However, he had lost touch with reality and wanted revenge on the people who had betrayed him. As Captain Blue and Sylvia embrace in a heartfelt reunion, the director tells Joe that the story is not complete. He snaps his fingers, and the space station's onboard computer warns of a large number of UFOs heading towards Earth. Blue tells Joe that a hero will be needed twice more to save the world. Joe attempts to leave, but not before Sylvia requests a V-watch from her father and to accompany her boyfriend. Beautiful Joe and a newly transformed Sylvia head out to stop the impending threat together. So, sort of like a fun, quirky little story. Yeah, it was definitely. Yeah, definitely fits, I think, into that uh, classic Japanese Majin-style film thing that they were going for with 
maybe a little bit more of an emphasis on the not the big monsters as much, mm-hmm. but the um the people running the show um that would maybe want like some type of bad event to happen just to justify whatever they're doing. Yeah, and I love the idea, especially from the story, of like having it in movie land, going through these different like kind of stereotypical like movie scripts, movie ideas, movie, you know, locations for it living that life out of superheroes. And it's so cool to, you know, have a director that wanted nothing more than to tell a superhero story in real life, bring that to the game and kind of interpolate themselves into Captain Blue in a way. It's, it's a really neat story of just even the creation of the game. And you can kind of tell Joe in that opening scene is sort of like an over the top, sort of like a loser, kind of like way too invested in these movies that are mm-hmm. like lame and outdated and things and so for them to then turn him into this cool protagonist is sort of a little bit of a joke in itself yeah it's it's i love it beautiful joe garnered a number of awards and nominations as well from various magazines popular gaming websites and video game award programs ign named beautiful joe gamecube game of the year and best action game of 2003 At GameSpot's Best of 2003, the game was nominated for Best Artistic Achievement in a Game, Coolest New Character, Best GameCube Game, Reader's Choice Best GameCube Action Game, and Reader's Choice GameCube Game of the Year. Beautiful Joe has been included in a number of best games lists in the years following its release. It was rated the 27th best game made on a Nintendo system in Nintendo Power's Top 200 Games list in February 2006, and the 10th best game on the GameCube in its August 2008 issue, reflecting on the top 20 games for each system. Both GameSpy and the G4 television program X-Play named Beautiful Joe the 9th best game of all time for the GameCube, and in 2007, Beautiful Joe was named the 17th best GameCube game of all time in IGN's feature reflecting on the system's long lifespan. Now, Beautiful Joe was successful enough to establish a franchise and a few other related media titles were released. Beautiful Joe was followed by a direct sequel titled Beautiful Joe 2, released for both the GameCube and PlayStation 2, and two spinoffs, Beautiful Joe Red Hot Rumble for the PSP and GameCube, and Beautiful Joe Double Trouble for the Nintendo DS. An anime adaptation of the game was produced by Group TAC, airing on the Japanese television station TV Tokyo, beginning in 2004, and being licensed for U.S. distribution by Genion Entertainment in 2005. A set of Beautiful Joe trading figures was released by Agatsuma Entertainment in October of 2005, while a series of action figures made by Jazzwares was released in 2006. V-Jump published a manga series of Beautiful Joe from November 2004. And in 2004, Capcom registered the domain name BeautifulJoe3.com suggesting another sequel. Shortly thereafter, the website was devoid of content. In January 2006, Atsushi Inaba expressed interest in developing a title in the series for the Wii. However, as none of Clover Studios' games proved to be an outstanding financial success, Capcom officially dissolved the subsidiary in March 2007 after the release of its final two games, Okami and God Hand. Its key members left to form a new company called Platinum Games. Capcom producer Jun Taguchi commented at the 2009 San Diego Comic-Con International that there have been currently no plans to continue with the series. Although Beautiful Joe has appeared as a playable character in Capcom's 2008 Wii fighting game, Tatsunoku vs. Capcom Ultimate All-Stars, and is a playable character in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Fate of Two Worlds, and Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. However, in 2012, Platinum Games announced the development of the Wonderful 101, then known as Project P100. This was the first project that reunited Kamiya and Inaba as director and producer on a title since the development of the Beautiful Joe series. Furthermore, the Wonderful 101 uses the same takusatsu thematics of the Beautiful Joe series, and the two share a similar art style, albeit different gameplay. This has led fans to hail the Wonderful 101 as a spiritual successor of sorts. The franchise would also later be featured in Archie Comics' Worlds Unite crossover, with several other Capcom and Sega series taking place in the Sonic the Hedgehog and Mega Man comics. 
and in Street Fighter V Arcade Edition, the fighter Rashid has an outfit based on Beautiful Joe. It is unlocked through completing four extra battles. Beautiful Joe received critical acclaim upon its release. Metacritic lists the GameCube and PS2 versions of the game at 93 out of 100 and 90 out of 100, respectively. The game's graphics, gameplay, and challenge were all common areas of praise among many reviewers. IGN gave Beautiful Joe an outstanding rating, noting that the beautiful cel-shaded graphics and high-intensity action make it one of the best action games on the GameCube and PlayStation 2. Likewise, Eurogamer called it imaginative, beautiful, engaging, and above all else, entertaining. Game Informer praised it as a completely original and highly entertaining work of art. Criticisms about Beautiful Joe have been few but consistent among reviews. IGN complained of the game's lack of boss variety. GameSpy has concurred, noting that the bosses were too easy due to a powerful attack that the player can perform. Reviewers have also criticized the lack of progressive scan in the game's PlayStation 2 port. IGN and Eurogamer have additionally pointed out that the PlayStation 2 port suffers slowdown in later stages of the game. In Japan, the GameCube version of Beautiful Joe sold through its initial shipment of less than 100,000 copies during the week of its release. Pre-orders of the GameCube version sold out on Capcom's North American website prior to its ship date, and Beautiful Joe debuted as the 10th best-selling game in the region. The PlayStation 2 version sold a poor 9,912 units in its first week of release in Japan. Worldwide, sales of the game reached 275,000 copies on the GameCube and 46,000 on the PlayStation 2. Sales of the game in both North America and Europe were lower than what Capcom had predicted, but due to its small budget, the game was considered by Anaba to be relatively successful commercially. And so we see now, with even all these stellar reviews, that this game... One, it just didn't really have the commercial backing that a lot of big AAA games have. And even if it did, I don't know that a game that's as stylized as Beautiful Joe really could have had the success that some other AAA titles have. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. It's like it's it's a really fun game. If you're able to play it on release and actually play a copy of it or own it like Derek does, he is one of those 270,000 people who has owns a copy, so very few. That's right. Uh, it was real. It was different for the GameCube, coming from like a Nintendo aspect of Super Smash Bros. and 3D elements into this really cool stylized way on taking down 2D action. It reminded me very much of the classic days of like TMNT or some like Streets of Rage type stuff. Oh, yeah. That some of those went to like almost a 3D aspect of it later on the road, but giving you this kind of just punch, kick, side to side, continue on adventure really was a breath of fresh air in some stalling of a couple of games that were coming out, a lot of those being much more targeted towards kids at the time. This kind of felt something to bridge that gap. It's interesting because this is really the era where we start to see games really push toward that realism. Maybe this is like right before that, where they start getting really good at it. But Beautiful mm -hmm. Joe comes out. And it's just like, hey, we're doing this very stylized thing. And I feel that Nintendo, really, that's where they're at their best. And I know that this is an, a Nintendo title, but because it is originally released for the GameCube, that, to me, probably puts itself in a position where it can't really necessarily be as successful because, you know, mm -hmm. the hash, hashtag true gamers out there really want the PS2 games, so they want the Xbox games, you know, having the GameCube was sort of this like underselling platform to begin with, then to release exclusively on that. I mean, it's, it's tough. Obviously, this game is great. And there are a lot of classics for the GameCube that I think are getting a lot more appreciation now. Obviously, the backwards compatibility of the early Wii consoles helps with that. Having some of those games being remastered and re-released for the Switch now. I think really shows how great some of those GameCube titles were. But at the time, yeah, I mean, it was a underperforming console when you compare it especially to the PlayStation 2, mm -hmm. who, you know, the greatest selling console of all time. So a lot of love for Beautiful Joe, 
I hope that it becomes more available for people um, in the future and that everyone gets to experience a little bit of a, a beautiful perspective. A beautiful perspective for a beautiful world. Beautiful, Derek. Very beautiful. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this has been our coverage of Beautiful Joe. If you're interested in more of these kind of like bite size or like drivable, kind of like going to and from work episodes, let us know. Um, we've got some more in the docket. We've got some more coming up and uh, we will catch you all on the next one. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Stay beautiful. Bye.